So, uh, hello also from my side. Uh, my name is Christian Hoff and I'm working in the Center for uh, Structural Mass Spectrometry uh, at the University of Halle and the group of Andreas Sins. And usually our expertise lies more into uh, shackling proteins with small molecules. So we're mainly focusing on cross-linking mass spectrometry instead of uh, native mass spectrometry. Um, so, therefore, I'm, I'm really honored to uh, be here today and to introduce uh, a collaboration project of mine uh, which is exclusively dealing with uh, native mass spectrometry. Uh, I don't want to go into detail that much with, uh, with cross-linking mass spectrometry. I just want to point out that it becomes especially powerful as an integrative method in structural biology when combined with other integrative uh, with other uh, structural biology methods, for example, uh, HDX, MS, uh, electron microscopy, and especially native mass spectrometry. So, it uh, has been roughly 10 years now since uh, our high mass modified QT2 was installed by MS Vision in our lab, and at this point we had basically no uh, experience in native MS at all. But in these 10 years, we established a variety of use cases uh, where we're using, uh, utilizing native MS on a regular basis. For example, we're monitoring cross-linking conditions with native MS for hard to predict proteins like uh, intrinsically disordered proteins. We're doing on a regular basis quality, quality control for our protein production with native MS. We're really combining native MS cross-linking with uh, fixing with cross-linking transient interactions of complexes and then doing not so native MS anymore, but intact measurements. And for sure, we're also uh, using native MS for complex subunit composition analysis and uh, protein complex stoichiometry analysis, what I want to talk about today. Because as I pointed out, uh, I, I have a collaboration project going on with uh, Professor Gary Sauls from the Microbiology Department in, at the University of Halle-Wittenberg. And uh, he introduced uh, his topic to us. He's, he's dealing with uh, formate hydrogen lyases and hydrogenases of uh, microorganisms. And he stated this is, is really needed these days because this is the basis for uh, microbiology based hydrogen production so sustainable energy green energy which is really desperately needed these days and there is a, a really advance going on the last two years where uh, already papers have been published with uh, hydrogen production out of uh, cardboard waste or garden waste and we were hooked and uh, we, we just decided to join uh, with a little bit of instant regret, I have to say, because uh, when you take a look at this uh, hydrogenase maturation cycle for high hydrogenase 2 of E. coli, there are four of those hydrogenases. Um, the maturation cycles are pretty complicated. I don't want you to really focus on, on the whole um, process. Uh, because the, 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 the center parts or the most interesting parts are uh, the, the lower ones where we have three major proteins, uh, uh, the, the green one, the HYP-D, the HYP-G, the red one, and the blue one, which is uh, the catalytic subunit of this uh, hydrogenase, the HYP-C. And the question here was, um, does this maturation cycle really look like this? Because all of this was based on assumptions and hypotheses. So there were no interaction studies at all at this point, and uh, our task was now to, to really uh, verify this maturation cycle somehow. And we have chosen native MS as the uh, way to go here, uh, because for the first complex, so um, I have to point out that the main part of this maturation cycle is to uh, somehow um, compose this um, iron cyanide uh, carbon monoxide uh, cofactor 
and to bring it into the catalytic subunit C. And it was not clear how this works. And uh, the first topic was um, to characterize this hub D, hub G complex if it really exists, because uh, all the time when hub G was overexpressed, they co purified the hub D protein. And if you want to uh, further purify one of the proteins for hub G, it was possible to remove the hub D without any problem, you end up with hub G. But if you want to remove hub G out of the uh, hub D solution, hub D just aggregated. And that was the assumption that. There has to be a complex, and if there is a complex, what is the stoichiometry of this? So we did uh, buffer exchange, we did native MS with our QDOF2, and we found out that there is actually really a heterodimer complex, uh, further conformed by uh, dissociation experiments, uh, but there was a, a downside because we had to do really excessive buffer exchange to, to get uh, those spectra. Uh, which was really uh, time-consuming and uh, if you consider this is an anaerobic complex and you do 10 hours of uh, aerobic buffer exchange, uh, it's, it's not that favorable for these protein complexes. Uh, so we tried to circumvent or speed up the, the buffer exchange process a little bit and then we stumbled upon uh, the online buffer exchange first introduced by the Vicky Vysocki group in 2020 where they used the HBLC system uh, and just a size exclusion column coupled to it for uh, the buffer exchange. And we tried this out, so we used the loading pump to do a size exclusion uh, with our proteins. Uh, we collected the proteins in a, a 20 microliter loop, then we switched and did uh, nano, with the nano pump of the HPLC system, the injection into the MOS spectrometer, and it worked like a charm. And we get reasonable spectra in not 10 hours anymore. Uh, it was now speed up to something like 15 minutes. So, first of all, we, we showed that there is a, a complex between those two proteins. And the next question was, um, is this cofactor, what we have here, uh, the FECN2CO cofactor, um, how is this delivered and how is this uh, built within those three proteins? There were two different uh, approaches or theories out there where, uh, first of all, HUB-D is uh, basically uh, used as a scaffold protein where the cofactor is built on, and then HUB-G joins, bringing parts of the cofactor, both proteins, making this complex I showed you, and then uh, the cofactor is completely constructed on this protein complex, and then HUB-C joins. We have an intermediate ternary complex, and uh, all of the proteins are dissociating in the end. And the second route would be, we have also the complex uh, HUB-D, HUB-G, where the, the cofactor is uh, constructed, then the HUB-D enters again the cycle. HUB-G takes over the, uh, the uh, cofactor and then interacts with HUB-C, delivering the cofactor and transferring it. So, but what is true now? So, we already had the co-purified HUB-D, HUB-G complex, so we decided to uh, add varying amounts or increasing amounts of the HUB-C protein and just look for the ternary complex, right? So uh, we measured these, uh, the, these protein samples and what we found out was um, there is no indication of a ternary complex at some point. We just see that the HUB-D, HUB-G complex signal intensity is decreasing and at the same time we have signal intensity for a new complex which is uh, also a heterodimer complex between the HUB-G and the HUB-C which uh, is now confirming more or less the second route of uh, this assumption so we will have HUB-G as a delivering protein which just shuttles the uh, created cofactor to HUB-C. Uh, but then, in the end, we also have to show 
that uh, just Hoop G and Hoop C, when put together as single proteins without any Hoop D in the solution, solves forming this heterodimeric complex. And just to make it here at this point a little bit shorter, uh, we also it, um, we also saw by adding these two proteins together the heterodimeric complex, which was further confirmed by dissociation experiments. So we again have a one-to-one -one stoichiometry. So now that all these interaction studies were conform confirmed um, and Hoop G really delivers this cofactor to Hoop C, you may be asking, but where is this cofactor and can we see it? We, we have to find out a Hoop G protein where the cofactor is actually attached to. So we uh, dig a little bit deeper in our uh, first complex we investigated. And we did the online buffer exchange, which takes now just 10 minutes. And we were looking at the dissociated five times charged hoop G protein. As you can see, we have here a signal for the uh, hoop G without any addition, so just the plain hoop, hoop G. And then we have a, a high signal intensity for hoop G with an additional 26 Daltons attached to it, which could be uh, C and minus non-covalently attached somehow, but we cannot prove this at the moment. And we have additionally a signal for hoop G plus 26 Daltons plus 136 Daltons, which is coincidentally the mass of the co uh, of the cofactor. So. We had one final experiment where we said, okay, we, we now have to prove that this is actually the cofactor because it uh, could be coincidentally something else. So we had a, a mutant at hand, a Hoop D mutant, which is C41A, uh, where the cysteine is mutated to an alanine. And we know from our collaborator that uh, the phenotype of this E. coli uh, strain will not have any functional um, hydrogenase 2. That means probably the core uh, functionality de uh, delivered by the cofactor is, is not given here because the cofactor is missing. And we did basically the same thing. We purified Hoop G, coincidentally co purified Hoop D, this time the mutated version, and we did the same native MS analysis and we took also a look at the five times charged um, Hoop G dissociation product. As you can see, there is uh, no sign of any pre uh, of any uh, version of the protein with the um, cofactor attached to it, and there is also interestingly no version which is uh, indicating the plain uh, Hoop G as well. So this is the the, the state where. At the moment, so we, we were able to verify in this whole maturation cycle the existence of the hoop d -Hoop g complex. Uh, we were able to show that there is a shuttling of the cofactor which is produced at the hoop g -Hoop -C, uh, d complex. You see it's still confusing for me, I'm working with it for five years now. <laughs> um, and we see uh, that the cofactor is transferred with hoops Hoop G to Hoop C. And I want to thank you for your attention. Yeah. Thanks a lot, Christian, for the presentation. Are there any questions for this presentation? Yeah, there was one. Hi, Christian. Thanks for your talk. Hi. Um, Concerning your, um, I think, uh, it was basically in, in all mass spectra, you also had quaternary complexes there. Yeah. Can you comment on them, what they are, if they are, basically, if they may have a function or not? Uh, that's a good question. We, we have to, uh, to do further analysis on that. I mean, uh, it, it could be just a concentration artifact, so to say. But uh, if you consider, for example, for the Hoop D, Hoop G complex that uh, when you further purify the complex and try to get rid of one of the proteins that the hoop D is uh, aggregating by itself, uh, it's more likely that you have multiple uh, versions with different stoichio 
stoichiometries, at least in, in small portions, are really present to prevent the HYPD from aggregation. So basically the next HYPG is taking over the, the released HYPD to prevent it from aggregation. This could be possible, but we have to investigate further if this is really the case. Okay, thanks. Uh, yeah. uh, thanks, thank you very much for the talk. Um, so you said that this complex is uh, sensitive to oxygen due to the biological system where it comes from? We expect it because it's yeah. uh, just produced when you grow E. coli anaer anaerobically. Yeah, and then um, you said that the uh, SEC coupled online to the um, native mass spectrometer was so the solution for your problem? Yes, kind so of. So I'm, I'm just thinking, so in general, when someone asks me, hey, I have a labeled protein that it's sensitive to oxygen, do you think that we can um, Analyze them in general in this so with the setup or uh, it, it's always hard if you consider doing uh, easy and and you always have uh, oxidation processes going on but uh, we, we try just to be fast and see uh, what is possible yeah. and uh, we know that when we did the manual buffer exchange which really took a long time because you have a complex of two proteins one of them is just nine kilodaltons you have to use a three kilodalton molecular weight cut of amicot for example which takes basically forever for one round of buffer exchange and we had to do 14 of them to get reasonable spectra uh, and there in those spectra you, you had nice protein signals but uh, just with additional um, oxidations and everything else was gone. So you basically saw one protein, the other protein, and oxidation products, and nothing else. Okay, thank you.